Hey guys, today we're starting a new series that I'm calling Faith Journeys, and I'm introducing you to the women who blog for Time of Grace. Now, a few of these people I knew in the past and I've worked with, but a few I really haven't you know, met or worked with at all. So just like you, I learned a lot about them. It's really neat and interesting to see a little bit about the people who write for Time of Grace and get to understand their perspective a little bit, where their faith journey has taken them. And so that's what this series is all about. Today, I wanna to introduce you to Emily Krill. Now, if you don't know Emily Krill, you'll want to know her. She is a force to be re reckoned with. She is just an energetic, passionately in love with the Lord woman who is just magnetic. Being around her just makes you want to be around her and also want to know your Lord and Savior just a little bit better. So enjoy today's episode. Emily, Hi. so good to see you again. When did we meet? I was trying to think, was it 2018 or 2019? Oh, 18, I think, honestly. Yeah. And I think I met your husband first. Yeah. At Awaken Alive, him and I were doing a breakout together. I mean, not like an official breakout, but a discussion group, a communication group or something together. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's how we met. And then later I met you too. And yes. so it's been a while. It has. Yes. Yeah, you're a brand new blog blogger for Time of Grace, but you are not new to blogging. We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. But for people who might not know who you are, can you just give us some details about your life? Sure. Yeah. 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 So I am, uh, I, I'm Emily Krill. I'm 40 years old. This is a very exciting year for me. Wait a second. <laughs> Hold on. I don't usually say things like that. Like I don't, nobody knows my age. Oh, <laughs> don't start oh, with your weight. Like no, let's, let's I, no, that, that. that I'm not going to get into, but 40, I'm really excited about. I feel like 40 is a big deal in okay. a good way. Like okay. I'm very excited to be 40. I'm, I'm happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I've earned some like clout maybe like nice. you can trust me i'm 40 <laughs> no. so, so if you haven't figured out yet this is why emily and i get along <laughs> like from the minute we met yeah anyway absolutely it was it was magical it was. um so 40 i have five kids uh all boys so that is very fun keeps me on my toes uh, age range 26 down to three Nice. Yes. Yes. Uh, my husband and I are in a band together. We have, uh, it's called His Way, and we do con Christian contemporary worship. And what else can I tell you? I love And when did that start? Because that's a, a recent in the last five years, isn't it? No, His it's Way? actually been around for a while, but I wasn't in the original oh, version. Oh, got it. So I didn't join until about... 10 years ago, it, but it's been around for 15 years-ish. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. It started as this idea that I was going to, you know, you know, allow my husband to have a hobby <laughs> <laughs> separate from me. <laughs> and he- That was, lasted a long time, didn't it? I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> Never mind, I'm joining. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm going to get on, in on this. So, <laughs> so yeah, so it's been around for a while, but um, it's slow, you know, we do, like just doing our own thing and then finding churches who are willing to partner with us and then- uh, just growing the idea and different people coming and going. And, and it was, uh, it's been, it's been a blessing. It's been a really cool thing to be able to do that with my husband and not want to tear each other's heads off. You know, I'm not, a, not every couple can do something like that together. And I learned that from my parents that they were able to work really well together. When, well, when we started it, we had, a, like, we got, you know, we, we started having babies right away because we came into the marriage with babies. Mike had two coming into the marriage. And so we were like, what are we waiting for? Let's just get this done. And so we always had little ones. Um, yeah. So it's been, that's been an interesting dynamic. So they've just grown up with it. Yep. yep. And touring and moving <laughs> around, going, doing things and all yep. that stuff. Do they help carry equipment too? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not, if, if you're not into the praise band thing or haven't done it, you don't realize how much work there is in moving things around and shuffling yeah. and loading and unloading and yeah. all that good stuff. So. Yeah. Always good to have a set of extra hands. Yes, yes, yeah, for and, sure. Yeah, and they they enjoy it. They they you might ask them and they might groan a little bit, but they they do a really great job. They nice. stay positive. Awesome. So you have a blog that you've been doing for a long time. How many how many years is your messy worship blog been? Yeah, um, it's been about nine years for that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So when did you start it, and why messy worship? Okay. So I started it because I was hitting, okay, so it's been 10 years because I turned 30 and I still hadn't read through the whole Bible. Oh, really? So, yeah. I had read it in pieces. I grew up wells and I had a, in, in, in a church, a uh, Christian school. And so I was learning the Bible versus memorizing them, hearing the, the accounts in the Bible, mm -hmm. but I had never read through cover to cover with intention and purpose. And I thought, you know what? 
this is something I want to do. This mm-hmm. is important to me. And so I said, I'm going to do this, but I don't want to just read it and have it go in one ear and out the other. I want to actually take something from it and retain something from it and and apply something with it. Nice. And yeah, it, it was. I wanted it to be a a real part of my life. And so yeah. um, so I learned about this method of journaling called SOAP. And yeah. SOAP is an acronym for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. And, um, and so I used that. So I only read one chapter a day, and I didn't get to it every single day. On average, I did it about, you know, between four and six days a week, depending on the week. And then I would, I would SOAP on every single chapter I read, just one chapter a day. And it took me eight years to read through the whole Bible. And I have books upon books of journal notes, but that's like the most precious thing to me. You know, the kind of thing where if your yeah. house started on fire, what would you grab? Those. That, <laughs> assuming my kids were out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but they, but that's how it happened. And as I went through the process, I also realized I need something more than me to hold me accountable. So that was the blog idea. So I'm going to blog about what I learned. So I would take the culmination of what I read every week in the Bible and journaled about, and I would look for three things to intersect. I would look for themes that God was teaching me from my readings themes that were going on in the world around me in our culture Mm -hmm. and themes that were going on in my heart. And every week there was always an intersection. And that intersection was, was very human, but, but God was in it. And so it was the, the, the collision of something perfect and something imperfect, which I coined as messy worship. Nice. So earlier I interviewed Linda and she had a book, Visible Faith, and she used the SOAP method. So if people aren't familiar with that and you you went through what it means, but what does it mean, scripture first? What what are you doing with the scripture first and then the observation? What what Can you describe those four steps? Absolutely. Yeah. So scripture is, you want to find one scripture. You got to um, discipline yourself to find the one verse, even if it's a, a just one sentence broken into two verses, figure out which part of that sentence, which verse calls to you most deeply. And I encourage people to find the verse that draws you closer to God. Mm -hmm. There will always be verses that don't make sense to you Mm -hmm. that will um, cause you to ask questions or maybe become curious. And those are not bad things. Those are great things. Curiosity leads to a lot of learning. However, in this particular method, the best thing I've found to do is find the verse that draws you nearer to God, that that helps you understand him better, Mm -hmm. that um, helps you love him more, Mm -hmm. that helps you realize your need for him more in such a positive way that you, like a friendship, like I I learned this about you today and it it helps me feel more connected to you, that idea. So that one verse, you write that out. I actually literally write them by hand Mm -hmm. because it helps me retain it better. Then observation is the context. You never want to take scripture out of context. You want to make sure that it's woven into the surrounding truths, uh, the history of that time. If you have a great commentary, use that. Um, If you just want to include, like I referenced before, sometimes verses are half of a sentence and then the next one is the other half. You can always include that in the O section of your notes. Um, Just making sure you can explain so that later when you want to reference this again, you can go back and you can say, oh yeah, that's why that verse was important or that's what was going on at that time that made that verse powerful or relevant or whatever. And then application is what, okay, so I know this now. I've learned this about you, God. What am I going to do with that information? I'm not just going to let it sit in my head or on a bookshelf. I'm going to go and do what? What is going to be different? And sometimes my applications were simple um, paradigm shifts in my mind. Like uh, I did think this and now I'm going to think this instead. Mm -hmm. Now I realize this. Sometimes it was a literal action, um, a relationship change, a, um, a, uh, a, pr- a different approach to an action. Um, any, it could be anything. And then P is prayer. So simply just connecting with God in a prayer about what you just learned and thanking him or asking for help in, in implementing a change mm-hmm. or whatever it might be. That is phenomenal that you were so deliberate going through the Bible. That is just amazing. It was one of my favorite things ever. And and I, I tell people about this because people often say, I don't know how to read the Bible. I want to, yeah. but I don't know how to. I don't know where to start. I don't know what it means. And this, this my favorite term is accessible theology. This makes it accessible theology. Mm. It just does. It brings it down to your level and allows you to create a personal connection with God. It's, That's phenomenal. It's fun. You know, like you too, I had the same experience. I went to Christian day school from kindergarten to eighth grade anyway. And I read my Bible straight through when I was 18. At the end of my senior year, I didn't know what to do with my life. So I took a year off from college and read my Bible straight through. And I was astounded at how much I didn't know. 
Mm-hmm. Because when I when I was confirmed and I graduated from my eighth grade class, I honestly thought I probably knew it all, you know? Yeah. And then I start getting into the Bible. I'm like, well, I have never read that. That is in the Bible. That? That? And it gave me such a different picture of God because I had gotten little snippets, you know, all kinds of little snippets, and I didn't have the full picture. And I learned so much from doing that. So hopefully that'll encourage someone to actually get in the Bible and really dig into who God is and what his character is and yeah, how that relates to us. Yeah, I would I would agree with that hope. In fact, if you're listening and you want to try that more, if you're curious about that method, I actually wrote a blog about it. Nice. And that's not the blog I picked to read today with you, but it is on my Messy Worship website and it's called The Trick That Made Me Love Reading My Bible. Nice. So if you just go to Messy Worship and you go in the search bar and you just type in The Trick, you will find it and it walks you through every step and it makes it super easy to just try. And I... It works for everyone. I even have my seventh grade son doing it with me. That was what I asked for for Christmas. I said, will you read the Bible with me? And so he sits down on Saturday mornings with me and does it with me and soaps with me. And he started in Genesis because he liked my idea of reading through the whole Bible. And he can do it. And he likes it. It's actually fun for him. So it's any age this works for. That's phenomenal. Oh, that's awesome. So as we've been emailing back and forth, I noticed your little signature block with a quote from C.S. Lewis. And I want to hear what why it is, why Why is this resonating with you? But it says, miracles do not, in fact, break the laws of nature. Where'd you find that? What season of your life? What was going on that you're like, yeah. Yeah, so it, uh, first of all, the quote makes me sound very intelligent and very sciencey, and I am not. <laughs> Um, I, I, I can't even remember when I found it. I'm a huge fan of C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Um, one of my, I, I love all the, the, um, Chronicles of Narnia, of course, who doesn't, but I also love A Grief Observed, um, that I connect deeply with that concept in that book. Uh, he lost his wife and wrote about the process of, of the loss. I saw Shadowlands. Oh. I didn't read the book. Okay. 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 You got to read the book. Um, but in, in that book, he has great quotes and I, I just, He's got a million amazing sound bites, but that one really, um, I was really drawn to it because when I look at nature, maybe especially because I don't understand science as well as uh, maybe other folks do, I just, I see miracles. When you, when you start to understand little parts and pieces of how trees do what they do or how whatever a water knows to run in what direction or salmon know to go upstream at a certain time, like that to me. That is a miracle. Like all of nature is a miracle. Or even um, I, I was uh, at an Awaken Alive event actually, and we had someone speak about um, how science and and God weave together as opposed to combat each other. And um, he pointed out, I can't think of his name right now, but he's an awesome, awesome Christian um, scientist who speaks to the involvement of God in science. And he said, in the Bible, it talks about when circumcision was supposed to occur and God commanded that it happens on the eighth day. And we they didn't know this then because they didn't have the science to show this or prove this. But now we know that on the eighth day after ver- birth, there is a clotting factor that is at its peak at day eight after being born. And God knew that because God designed that. But that's that is that is not breaking the law of nature or uh, law, yeah laws of nature, and it's a miracle. And it, like to me, it's so clearly connected that God made all yeah. these things work exactly right. It is not a coincidence. It is not an accident, and it doesn't break the laws of nature because God created nature. He made the laws. It's just amazing that there are miracles around us all the time. And when we slow down enough to notice them, it blows my mind. Like I just love that awe factor that sometimes we get too busy to experience. Yeah, and, no kidding. And it'd be great if we didn't get too busy. Oh, isn't that the truth? Yeah. You and your mm-hmm. husband, Mike, are raising young men. What burdens your heart right now about raising children today? Yeah. So I have two thoughts in response to that. Um, number one, uh, I'll t- share the burden with you, and it actually relates to a soap a soap I just recently did. I'm in I'm in Numbers right now. I'm going through the Bible a second time, and I'm only as far as Numbers. But um, in Numbers Numbers 11, it talks about this <clears throat> this concept of um, foreign rabble, and I think that's such a funny term. But foreign rabble in this ver- verse four, chapter Numbers 11, verse four, and foreign rabble refers to 
a few Egyptians that chose to leave Egypt with the Israelites when they mm-hmm. left after the 10th ten- plague. And they're considered foreign rabble, which is just such a, right? Like when you think of that, you get an image in your head, like mm-hmm. rabble rousers or whatever, right? But in this case, they really were doing that. And maybe they left Egypt with good intentions. I have no idea. It doesn't speak to that directly in that verse. But in this case, the verse says, then the for- foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain, oh, for some meat, they exclaimed, because they all, all they had was manna at this point, right? And so they're like, man, I miss those burgers or whatever. <laughs> and, and the Israelites, it, you hear it, the the rabble started at first, right? So not we're not pointing fingers, but that's what, that's what it says. <laughs> You're kind of pointing fingers. <laughs> but then the Israelites were like, oh, burgers. I miss burgers. I forgot about those, right? Whatever they were, like, so... So, so that's what concerns me about this generation. We've got social media surrounding us. We've got noise surrounding us constantly. And if we're not careful, if, if even me, I'm not removing myself from this challenge or this concern, if we're not careful, that rabble, that foreign rabble is going to infiltrate our ears and make us crave burgers. And I love burgers. I'm not literally talking about burgers, but I'm talking about like, what, what, what are we missing that we don't need to be sad about missing? And who's pointing that out to us versus steering us back towards what do we need to be focused on? And, and I think it requires a massive amount of intention to have a positive experience with social media. And I don't hear people talking about that as much as I believe it could be talked about. Because social media is not just like all things, money. Money's not the problem. A love of money is the problem. Social media might not be the problem. Love of social media or a lack of intention in the use of social media is the problem. Right. There are great influences out there on social media. I'm participating in one right now. But you have to make sure you have the right filters on mm-hmm. or rabble is happening. Yeah, because all of the devil of the world and our sinful flesh all point to us and tries to make us the God versus <clears throat> going and remembering that God is God. And that his ways are best. And it's so easy if you're listening to music, if you're watching TV, if anything is con- constantly pointing us away from God yep. to get what we can get out of life, do what we can do, do make yourself the God versus eh, God's way probably is best because mm-hmm. he promises, you know, that there will be blessing to follow this. And yeah, I have young adults and I know what you're talking about. It's a constant, it's a constant pull for sure. So you guys have also, though, been ministering to teens and young adults for years. We were doing that together. So what is it that excites you about the young people today? Yeah. So that was the second thing I referenced. I had two things. That was the second thing, and it was a, it's a hopeful thing. So um, a fellow mom, a Christian mom, shared this with me. She heard it in a devotion in a mom's group, and I thought, this is it. This is what excites me. God made our next generation for this time. Mm. He chose this time in our world's history for these kids to be born. That's so exciting to me. So exciting to me. That brings me hope knowing God made, God has intention behind that, Mm -hmm. that God chose my five boys to be born now. And so although the challenges of this time being unique to this time are, might be intimidating, might be terrifying to me, uh, I'm, I'm on my way towards the back end of this time and my kids are entering into it and God knows that and he chose that. And that's so exciting to me. And so to explain that to my kids and empower my kids and and the kids that I bump into that aren't even my biological or adopted kids, to help empower them and connect them to that truth and what that means and help them understand how to connect with God so they can have their own uh, own way to access. What does this mean for me? What am I? What am I put on this earth to do right now in this time that God chose with intention and purpose? That's super exciting to me. And when was it ever easy? Hmm. Was it easy for Noah, or you know, for the Apostle Paul, or <clears throat> for the? I mean, you know what I mean? Or da- Daniel? Did he have any? You know, we think that we're in a really hard time sometimes. Right. When was it ever easy right. to be a person of faith? Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. So praising God is a big part of your life. Yes. And you were talking about his way. What has being in a band that travels around, tours, going to churches, worships with other people, what has that taught you about worship? So um, 
first of all, specifically this style of worship, this music version of worship is awesome. If you, even if you don't, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't sing, but I sing. Everybody sings, whether it's in the car, in the shower, or on on a in the front of a church, right? You're going to sing. Everybody does it. It doesn't matter if you're good or not. Um, God never says in the Bible, only the good singers sing, right? Mm-hmm. right? So he's got people blasting trumpets. He never said you got to take lessons. It's Music is an it important... <laughs> Yes, especially yes. if you're in the front of the church, we would prefer <laughs> at least tune. I, yeah, I'm not endorsing. On no. <laughs> but but as far as the purpose of worship goes, my husband pointed out in one of the services we were doing, we were leading. He said, when you pray and sing, you are praise sing. And so mm-hmm. that's the attitude we bring. And that's 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 what's important to worship is that it's. It, the the heart of it is focused towards the object of Mike Westendorf even um, he's part of the Awaken Alive crew he actually founded it and he pointed out too in one of our prep times before worship he said we don't bring offerings to people we're not bringing this music for the to the people sitting in the seats around us this is to God and we're doing it together and so just the process of remembering that and preparing my heart for that even the day before you know what am i doing tomorrow how am i preparing for that the night before uh, worship worship I, intention seems to be the big word that i keep bringing up in this in this but but it is it's about intention it's mm-hmm. about where your heart's at where your mind's at why you're doing it and even if you're up in front of people or sitting in a chair participating. It doesn't matter. You, it's you and God. It's you talking to God. It's you saying, I need you. It's you saying, you're amazing. It's you. It's just a conversation. It's just done with a little bit of melody behind it. And it's so nice to even think about that because I imagine there are times that you come in a little frazzled. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that focuses your heart right there because what are you doing? You're singing to God saying, mm-hmm. well, hey, hey, you are amazing. Whether or not I am yep. or whether life is or not doesn't matter because you are. Yeah. Yeah. There's been moments where, again, I feel like this is a miracle. There's been moments when I know I hit a wrong note. I know I missed an entrance. And before I before I started that service, I always pray, God, let them hear what you are saying. Let them hear your voice, not mine. And in those cases where I know I messed up, Mike will later go and watch if it was live streamed or filmed or whatever. And he goes, that didn't happen. What you said happened didn't happen. Because God is good. God didn't allow that to distract people from worship. Mm -hmm. And maybe God even used that to keep me humble. Like, remember, this is not about you, Emily. This is not about the the Emily show. This is not a concert. This is not a show. Mm -hmm. This is worship. This is a completely different animal. And God is working through this in every facet of it. Oh, I love that. If you could sum up your faith journey in one word, what would it be? I think the word would have to be curiosity. Um, I'm big into strength finders. I think you know that. I co- so I'm a, I'm a Christian life coach as well. And so I coach people on taking the strength finders test, getting their top five strengths, and then using those five strengths to understand how God designed you and to connect with the DNA of God too. Because mm-hmm. although we are imperfect, we're reflecting the perfect version of all those strengths. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, when I took the test, I looked at my results and I, I saw things that I've been criticized for my whole life. And it was like this moment where I'm like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. These are good things. What? What? Like, it was this big moment for me where I realized these can be used for good. These are these are amazing things. And one of the three of my five are basically curiosity. Yeah. So I'm just super, super curious. And once I realized that, I could use that to honor God and to encourage others, even if it's just saying those things that you're cursing, those things that you're regretting or or grumbling about. No, no, those are gifts. And here's let's let's explore them. Let's look at how God reflects curiosity. Let's look at how God reflects, you know, I also I also have empathy in the top five. So just learning about those things and connecting them to scripture. Where is there evidence in scripture that God these are godly qualities? Because if they're not evidenced in scripture, then we can't call them strengths. Mm. So so, so curiosity has really, really, really connected me to God in a very personal way. And I encourage everybody to, you know, I, if, whether it's not, if it's, if it's um, the Myers-Briggs, if it's the Enneagram, whatever your thing is, 
figure out a way to understand how God designed you with intention and purpose and 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 really dial in on that and allow it to be a way to praise God. And curiosity has done that for me. So you just bless me a lot because I have said this more than once, multiple times. Just recently in an interview with Pastor Mike, I said, strategy is my number one trait. And it's been more of a curse to me my entire adult life than it, because I can see things. You know what I mean? So I see what's not working. And I'm like, oh, you know what should be done? But, you know, a lot of people don't like change. <laughs> right? So I have learned that I can't just go, hey, you know what would be so much better in this instance? Like, because a lot of people are like, uh, it's just fine the way it is. <laughs> yeah. So kind of easing my way into, I noticed something. Do you want to hear about it? Or, but it's, it's what you said. So it's the things that you feel are a curse, finding your way to use them in a way to honor and worship God versus seeing them as a curse because there's, there's no mistakes, right? Right. Right. So that was a huge blessing. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. I'm glad. Okay. I asked you to bring a blog along. Yes. Did you pick one out? I did. I did. Um, it is actually uh, about Costco. <laughs> and Jesus. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. Okay, it is called What Costco Taught Me About Worship. I love Costco's parking lot. Let me be even more specific. I believe that Costco deserves a major award for figuring out the exact right dimensions to provide for each individual parking space. These parking spots are perfectly constructed for life. They are big enough to actually open car doors without dinging the car next to me. As a parent of five expert door dingers, this is a big deal. Huge. It also allows me to need less of a wind-up to park accurately between the between the yellow lines. I can almost park diagonally in these things and still fit. In short, these glorious parking spaces are designed for humanity. Not only are they designed for it, they welcome it. I know parking spaces sound like a ridiculous thing to be excited about, but the thing is, there isn't much else in this world today that is that accepting of mistakes. We cancel celebrities and other public figures who don't perfectly live up to our expectations. Instead of responding to mistakes with grace, we react with grudges and gossip, most days, even the voice inside my own head won't let me live down the foolish things I think, say, and do each day. But God is different. God has always been different. For example, did you know that when the first tabernacle he had the Israelites build, way back when Moses was around, had a spot for his people's mistakes? It was called the Place of Atonement, and it wasn't some random afterthought, bucket in the corner type of thing. It was the, sand, it was the cover that sat on the Ark of the Covenant. The place of atonement was the place where God's presence would dwell and where the priest would meet with God to reconcile the sins of all the people. It was made of pure gold, and on top of it rested two cherubim angels, also made of gold, placed at each end facing each other with their wings spread out above it. Exodus 25, 17 through 22. God made a spot for us to rec reconcile with him. He lovingly crafted this beautiful golden spot for us to park our imperfections with him and fully realize his love and grace. It wasn't made with resentment, bitterness, or shame. It was made with the same care that he showed when he sent his one and only son to die in our place. This got me thinking, do I offer a beautiful, intentional, precious, Costco-sized, actually God-sized place for my people, my friends, families, coworkers, kids, etc., to be loved exactly as they are, even at their worst? Or do I only offer airport-sized door dinger parking spots plastered with grudge-holding security cameras? Yikes. Starting today... I'm going to get more intentional about living out a God-sized parking lot spot attitude towards my people in my life. I'll do this by using real parking spots as an association tool. Every time I park anywhere, I will pause and think about any compact car parking, parking spots I'm allowing in my heart and confess them to God. Then I will ask for his help to repaint the spot with room for a semi-truck instead. Dear God, I'm betting you won't have any literal parking spots in heaven. I'm also certain you won't have any figurative parking spots there either because you've promised that there will be no more tears, sadness, or sin in heaven. Help me to live with your grace and promise as my focus now here on earth too. Help me to offer the kind of love you give to me. Amen. Oh my goodness. If people haven't figured it out yet, this is exactly why you're the type of person that I met and instantly fell in love with. <laughs> like, Thank you. The first time we met, we sat down and it was just game on right off the bat because you're so easy to talk to oh, and super likewise. transparent and just there's nothing false about you. There's no presumption. There's no walls. There's just honesty and lay yourself before the Lord. I love that about you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're so you. encouraging. I was so nervous coming here today and you're just making it so easy. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. That's the, that's the whole goal. So thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thank you. God's you blessings on the rest of these. These are great. Thanks. Yeah.